Mike Andy said, I'm, uh, I'm one of the co-investigators on the, uh, the Curiosity rover that's going on Mars right now. And I thought I'd just give you an update of some of the interesting stuff we've, di we've discovered, where we are now, and what the uh, mission is going to be like. And so that's the usual um, part of the title. We're moving toward this mountain, which is going to be our ultimate goal on the mission. But there's been a lot of interesting stuff along the way, and so I'll, I'll hit some of that as we go along. Okay, so uh, NASA and, and other countries have lots of Mars missions going on right now, and this is a chart from NASA talking about them, and so I'll just briefly go through that. We have two rovers working on Mars now, the Opportunity rover, which landed in uh, 2005 or something, sometime a very long time ago, 2004, and it's still, it's still going on Meridiani Planum, still working away. The one I'm working with, Curiosity rover, landed in 2012, um, and they're supported by this whole swarm of orbital spacecraft, satellites, Mars Odyssey, Mars Express is from ESA. Uh, it's got a, some really good radar instruments on it. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has got a great camera. You'll see pictures from that, the high-rise camera, as we go along. MAVEN uh, arrived at Mars last year, and its, <coughs> its point is looking at the uppermost atmosphere of Mars. And also last year, the uh, Mars Orbiter mission from India, the Indian Space Research Organization, arrived. And that's just a fantastic thing to see the Indians, uh, uh, Indians do that. That's their f basically their first attempt at a Mars, a Mars mission, and it worked perfectly. And they went into orbit exactly as they were supposed to. Uh, another pair of missions, the tra ESA Trace Gas Orbiter, European, launched in March this year, and it's on its way. It's an orbiter, which is going to look for gases in the Martian atmosphere, especially methane, which might be a sign of life. And it's also going to have a lander that's going to flop down on the surface and last three or four days, if I remember right. It's not very long. We'll just do a little bit. Um, <clears throat> a couple other, there's other rovers in the plan or landers on the surface. Uh, Andy mentioned the InSight lander which was supposed to have launched uh, this year, but they had some serious problems with their major scientific instrument, and so it's been put off at least until 2018. Good launch opportunities to Mars happen about every two years, every 26 months. So um, there's that buzzing noise. <laughs> if, if, if the tornado's here, please let us know. <laughs> I've never seen one. I'd love to. <laughs> Right. Um, okay, so anyway, it's been delayed at least till 2018, and the Europe, ESA, the Europeans, have an ExoMars rover that they've been planning, and that was supposed to launch in 2018, but they've put it off. There have been just all sorts of engineering problems with that, so they've put that off until 2020. And the U.S. has a, another rover in the plans, so far named Mars 2020, which is supposed to land in 2020, and its main purpose is going to be to look for, to, to collect some rock samples possibly to bring back. And this is all part of NASA's big scheme to look for life on Mars. We started looking for water. This is the excuse or rationale for the earlier missions, thinking that water is essential to life as we know it. Following that, we call it exploring habitability, environments that might have been suitable for life as we know it on Mars, including water and whatever else might be needed. And then down here in the future, we're actually going to seek signs of life. So that's cool. Okay, so that's what's out there now. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about, uh, about the environment at Mars. Uh, Mars is, and these are Earth and Mars, to the same scale, but not the same right distance apart, of course. Uh, Mars, is, Mars is rather smaller than the Earth. It's about two-thirds the size of the Earth. And, but it's, it's got some similarities. They both have polar ice caps here, for instance. They have clouds here, and of course, the lovely clouds on the Earth. They have orangey-looking deserts. And you can see here's the Sahara, and then the Arabian Peninsula, and, and Namibia down here. Uh, the difference, of course, is that the Earth has these huge oceans. Mars does not. This dark stuff on Mars, which we'll see over and over through the talk, is not water. It's black rock. It's basalt lava rock like the stuff that's in Hawaii or maybe that you have in your, your uh, barbecue grill. Um, so that's, that's uh, what, what they look like. Um, <clears throat> 
the temperatures are conditions otherwise are very different on Earth and Mars. Uh, and I got this beautiful graph that the Jet Propulsion Laboratory just put out. The Jet Propulsion Lab is the group that built the rover and is running it that I work with that runs the rover. And so what they've done here is they've taken the temperatures that we've measured on Mars with, the, with our Curiosity rover and compared them to temperatures in Los Angeles. And of course Los Angeles because that's where the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is and everyone goes on about how wonderful and beautiful the temperatures in California are. Well, they're not quite so clement on Mars. In the, the years we've been on Mars, the temperature has never gotten up to 32 Fahrenheit, zero centigrade freezing. It's never gotten that warm. It, I did think the warmest has been maybe about 25 or, uh, Fahrenheit. But at night, it gets really cold, like to minus 130 Fahrenheit, which is pretty much the coldest temperature that's ever been measured on Earth. I think they're a little bit colder some places in Antarctica. But and you can see that the range in temperatures in a single day on Mars is just enormous. Um, so that's not really so good. And of course, with the temperature below freezing, it's sort of hard to have liquid water. And that makes it difficult for life at the moment to be at the surface. Uh, another difference with Mars is uh, the atmosphere is very low pressure. It's about a hundredth of the at atmosphere pressure that we have on Earth right now here near sea level, equivalent to being at about 100,000 feet in the Earth's atmosphere. And your airplanes typically fly at 30 to 35,000. So this is way up there. There's not a lot of, lot, not a lot of air. <coughs> and if that weren't bad enough, the air the g on Mars is nearly all carbon dioxide gas. There's essentially no oxygen in it. So even if you had enough pressure of this gas, you'd still die from breathing it. It's not real good right now for us. Oh, and, and by the way, the weather, weather forecast for Mars today is sunny, cold, and no clouds. A little bit of dust in the atmosphere, but, but there's no problem with allergies. <laughs> okay, so we're talking, let me get back to the, to the, to the rover, the Mars, Mars mission here. Uh, we launched from uh, Cape Kennedy on uh, November 26, 2011, and it was a beautiful Atlas V launch. Just went up perfectly. It was absolutely gorgeous to see. And here's the orbital diagram with sort of the orbits in the right, the right scale. So we launched there and took a typical coasting orbit out toward Mars. It takes about nine months to get there. And so we landed on Mars in August, on August 6, uh, 2012. And this was a big excitement. There are many of us that thought that the landing system was never going to work, and that's a completely different talk. But it did. Uh, and one of the, the satellites, the, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbital, as I said, has this gorgeous camera, the high-rise camera. And it caught a picture of the Mars Science Laboratory floating down to the surface. And here's the Mars surface. And there's this funny pair of white things here. Blow that up. There's the parachute. And there's the spacecraft as it's going down on its parachute heading toward the surface. So it actually arrived. And this is the first picture taken from the surface. This is what we call the hazard camera. It's almost at ground level. And you can see the rover wheels here. And in the background, this big mountain, which is called Mount Sharp. And then this black stripe you'll see all the way through the talk. It's called, there's black sand dunes called Bagnall Dunes. So that's a good... Um, a good landmark to keep, in your, to keep in your mind here. So that was the first picture from the surface. Okay, so where was it we landed? We landed in a big uh, impact crater, an asteroid impact crater, near Mars's equator here, uh, called Gale Crater. It's named after a, uh, one of the early astronomers who studied Mars. And we landed inside the rim, obviously, but away from this mountain in the center. There's a fairly flat area down at the side. And we landed pretty close to the center of where it was we were supposed to land, just you know, a couple kilometers long on the landing, but no big deal. Um, and so here's, here is this mountain that you saw in the previous picture, this mount called Mount Sharp. And then this black stripe we'll see along here are these sand dunes. And so this is our intention was to go traipsing off towards the mountain. <coughs> Why, why did they pick this site? Well, from orbit, from uh, <coughs> the, the MRO and, and Odyssey spacecraft, 
could see something about the rocks here. And at the base of the mountain, the rocks have a, minerals that are, could well have been deposited by water. There are clay minerals which almost have to have water. And then there's an iron oxide mineral called hematite, which probably involved water. The upper part of the mountain is all sulfate minerals, which don't necessarily involve water. And this fitted in with the, the current theory of Mars's history that very early in its history, it was a fairly wet, warm place where there was liquid water available around the surface or at the surface. And then at some point it changed, got very cold and dry, and at that point there's no liquid water anymore. And so what were, when the ideas was that that, that, that change in climate is what we're seeing, he, what we, they saw here from the change from water water minerals like clays up to the drier minerals. So we're hoping maybe if we go to this spot, we can watch, what's hap watch what happened as Mars went from a, a, a wet, warmer place to the cold, dry place now. So that's a real excuse for going here. Besides which, it has beautiful views and we can have these gorgeous cameras and they can actually have something to see instead of endless flat planes, like the Opportunity camera. Okay, so that was where we, that was our plan. This is the rover. This is about uh, seven feet from bottom up to the top of the mast there. And I just want to talk a little bit about what kind of instruments and, and uh, devices we have. It's got six wheels, three on each side, and this really clever design called Rocker Bogey, which I'll talk about a little bit more, which allows it to go over pretty big rocks fairly safely. So that was part of the design, so if they got in really rough terrain, they'd still be able to travel. Uh, for instruments, it has this mast here which holds some cameras up above the surface about to human eye level. Uh, so actually four separate cameras down in here, the main one is the mast cam. Above that is this box which is ChemCam. This is a device that has a laser inside, shoots the laser out to the rock and vaporizes the rock. And from the light that's given off when it's vaporized, that's, it, there's a telescope here that looks at that spot, and from the colors of the light that's given off, it can tell something about the composition of the rock. So it's a chemical analysis tool. The other cool part is this really long, capable arm with a head out here that's got all kinds of instruments on it. Uh, one we'll see a lot of is Molly, which is like a hand lens, so it can take very close up pictures of the, uh, <coughs> of the rocks and of the rover. Uh, this APXS is another chemical analysis instrument so that we can tell what the chemistry of, of the rocks are. It's also got a drill. So we can drill the rock, take the cuttings of the rock, and deliver it inside the body to two, uh, to two other instruments. Sam uh, takes the rock, heats it, and looks at the gases that are given off from the rock. The other one I'm involved in is Chemin here which is a, an x-ray diffraction device, and that allows us to tell the crystal structures of the substances that go into it, the minerals if you, of, of them. And from that, we can tell a lot about how the rocks formed. Okay, so that's basically what the payload is like. Um, where did we go? We landed, this is again a view from the high-rise orbiter, landed in here, this Bradbury landing site, and traveled, you can see the rover tracks, coming across here, and that's the rover there seen from orbit. Um, scale there. Uh, Got to talk about a couple things here. First of all is time on Mars. We measure time on Mars in sols, which is the version of days. And they can't just be Earth days because the Mars day is about 15 minutes longer. So after a while they get out of sync, and so it's just easier to talk about sols rather than Earth days. So that's the Sol Zero is when we landed at this point where the rover was right there, Sol 116, um, almost four months in. Um, the names, uh, well, Bradbury was named for Ray Bradbury with permission of his family. Uh, but the other names are come from places on Earth. And when, before we landed, we, the geologists in the group, were each given areas, uh, squares, to map out and figure out what was there. And they gave their square a name for some place on Earth. And so the names that for, for places in that square were assigned from similar places on Earth. Like this area was up in northern Canada, so this region here ended up being called Yellowknife Bay, which is a bay on one of the big lakes up in Canada and also named one of the major towns up there. So you'll see these funny names along the way, some from 
some from Missouri, uh, Montana, some from Australia, some from South Africa. Okay, so we traveled down in there and uh, spent a while looking around Yellowknife Bay. This is what it looks like. And for me, I, I grew up in New Mexico, and this is a fairly familiar looking desert scene. You got rocks and sand and more rocks and more sand. These are sandstones and mudstones. What you don't see, what we didn't see any of were the trees, bushes, grasses, animals. You know, even, even in West Texas, you find a couple scraggly creosotes down at the bottom or something. None of that here. It's too cold, no water. But we went and looked at the, the rocks down in there and drilled some to put them into our instruments. And this is a picture that has the arm sticking out and it's drilling right now. And there's our Mount Sharp in the back and these dark dunes. A uh, picture of the drill holes, a test drill hole and then the main drill hole. And we took some of this and put it into the instruments inside the rover. And the big find from that was that these rocks had a lot of clay minerals in them. And remember, the clay minerals need water to form. These are very fine-grained rocks. They look like mudstones, about the same grain size as a mud would have. And so the best bet on how this stuff formed was that it formed in some kind of lake, some kind of lake liquid water on Mars long time ago. The best guess on the age of these is about three and a half billion years, but there's a lot of uncertainty in that. But it's a long time ago. So here is our first sign that maybe we'd come on a place where there was liquid water once and we had potentially habitable environments for life as we know it. Okay, so while we were drilling holes, there were other holes there too. And um, one of our scientists, Ken Edgett, is a, a really clever guy with a great imagination, saw these, these holes and there are, you know, there's this like a slab of rock here and next to it there's a hole in the ground. Here's another one in this inset right there. And we found quite a few of these out there. And Ken put two and two together and saw this area here where there's another slab of rock with it looks like black sand coming out from under it and maybe see a little flow of black sand down in there. And he thought, well, this is a gopher hole. Gophers make tunnels. They come out one side and they throw all the dirt out the back side. <laughs> well, it, yeah, it's not gophers. But on the other <laughs> hand, no one knows to this day what is going on here. We, we, this was, we found this like right after we landed, maybe you know, December of, 20, of 2012. And to this day, no one has any clue why there are holes there, why the holes aren't filled up with sand or dust, which blows around all the time, and why the sand was coming out from under it. So there are, there are real puzzles here. I don't know if this is important in the grand scheme of things, but it's a puzzle. Okay, so from there, this is a broader map, we drove over to Yellowknife Bay and then started driving down here across the plains. And again, here are our big sand dunes and the mountain is down here. Um, <coughs> This is not in the right place when it says Bagnold Dunes. I wonder, well, okay, it's a, it, that's not, oh, actually, I'm, I'm sorry, it is. That black line over there I, is, is, is the dunes. But this is what the plains looked like that we, that we drove across. And they're pretty unimpressive. They're just, you know, rocky plains. And so we tried to drive pretty fast to get over them to get down here to where, where interesting rocks seem to be exposed. And in driving over those plains, we had a problem. And you've probably heard about this. We had holes in the wheels. And this is a picture taken on Sol 490, which shows th the wheels on the left side of the rover, left side as you're looking toward the front of the rover. And these are taken by that Molly camera on the arm. So the camera sticks out, sticks under the rover, and looks around under the rover to look at the wheels underneath it. And what, what, what they saw, first of all, there are lots of holes in the wheel. Some of them are intentional, like these here, which are sort of like mile markers. Others are not intentional. And we've got this beautiful model of the wheels that, that JPL has sent us. And so this is the size of the wheel you're looking at. And so it's not quite bad. Um, the wheels have... Um, these holes on them, these are so you can 
as you drive along, you can see these marks and see how many, see how many times the wheel is turned around as it goes. It's good for seeing if the wheels are slipping. Uh, the wheels also have um, these raised ridges on them. They're sort of like tread on your car's tires. They're called grousers. I don't know where the name comes from. But the, they, they give the wheel more strength and they give it a little more traction. And unlike this piece, which is plastic, the, the wheels on the rover are made of thin aluminum metal. It has to be thin because it, it's very expensive to send any kind of mass out, out to Mars. But anyway, what we had was not only the holes that we knew were there and expected, but new ones. There's, there's a, a dent, a penetration, a puncture. There's another one up here. Here's a rip in the wheel. And this just, this was a great shock. It had not been expected to see this kind of damage at all. And so the rover engineers, we sort of stood down for a while while they tried to figure out what was going on and, and how to prevent any more damage from happening. Uh, it turned out that the problem is an un unexpected interaction of the rocks and the surface. The surface wasn't how they expected it. The surface there has pointy hard rocks, which everyone sort of expected to find, but the, what hadn't expected was that they're stuck hard in the ground. And you can see perhaps over here, this is a picture of the ground in that area, and this pointy rocks, nice pointy one there sticking up, but they're stuck in this slab of hard stuff. Looks like concrete. And if you've been in West Texas or Arizona or stuff, you've probably seen this caliche where the soil gets really, really hard. That's what we've got on Mars there, and it's holding the rocks in really tight. To give you an example of how tight it is, take a look at this weird rock. It's undercut. You know, if that rock weren't stuck hard in the ground, it would fall over, right? So this hadn't really been expected, and it's a weird interaction where you've got these rocks that are stuck in the ground and can't move. The suspension on the rover doesn't work quite the way they'd hoped. Now this is an image, of course, of the rover in the lab. And you can see the wheels, front, middle, and back. And there's this wonderful rocker bogey suspension system that allows it to go over big rocks. What wasn't quite understood clearly at the time was that the way this is arranged, the front wheels don't only carry the weight of the rover, they also get forced down. You see the angle here of the, the strut that's holding them. As the rover moves, the wheel sort of gets forced down into the ground. Same but not so much with the front wheel. And so if a wheel like this comes across a sharp pointy rock, it can't roll over it. It's forced onto the rock and the rock punctures the wheel. Doesn't happen to the rear wheel because the, the suspension on the rear wheel is straight up and down. So there's nothing that's forcing it against, against the rocks the same way. So that was the issue and the way we solved this, the way the engineers solved this, I'm not going to take credit, uh, the way they solved it was very simple. We drive backwards. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean think about it. This is now the front wheel and it's just driving along, but these two wheels, they're being pulled behind sort of. So if they come upon a rock, they just lift over it and go on by. So we spent most of the, most of the uh, uh, mission has been driving backwards just because of this problem. <laughs> Um, it has, it's been a good thing because we've still got a lot of wheel damage. Uh, this is the middle wheel as the previous slide, uh, Sol 490. This is Sol 1315, which is like two months ago. And this is that hole we saw in, in 490. The same hole is right here. It's about the same. But there's a vague little rip here, and that's become a huge hole. There's a vague little rip down here, and that's become a huge hole. There's a dent and puncture there, a new rip, another puncture there. The wheels are getting beat up. And the engineers have looked at this, and there's no danger anytime soon that the wheels are going to fail. They figure that we're, we've used about 40% of the usable life of the wheels, which is OK. I mean, if your tires were worn 40% down from being brand new, you wouldn't have any problem about going out and driving to Austin or something. So we're, we're sort of in that state. It's something we need to watch and still need to be careful about. OK, so there's the wheels. Um, so we've kept driving and driving along. I want to show you a couple 
first stop at this place, uh, Kimberly, to show you a couple of pictures from there. Um, this is an orbital view looking, looking down on this site. Again, the high-rise uh, orbiter. And we stopped here because it had such a, such a nice collection of different rock types. This stuff, this smoother surface, is the Hameke Plains that we'd been traveling over. But finally, we could see below them and see there are these lighter colored hills that are sticking up through it. There's this flat rock here. There's some rock that looks like it's got lines that run like east-west almost. So those, we went there to, to see what was going on with these rocks. And perhaps you can see the rover track. I can barely see them from here. But there go the tracks down here and then up and around and all. And perhaps you'll notice these circles here and here. Those are where the rover turns around. It drives backwards. But it can't see so well backwards because the, 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 the power reactor is in the way. So it drives, stops, turns around, makes little, this little donut so it can take a picture of where, the, where it's going to go the next day. And when they got that figured out, then they'll start out the drive the next day by turning around so it's going and backing, the re backing on that day's drive. So that's what the little circles are. Um, the next slide is what this area looks like and this hill is this hill. So what we're, what the, the, the people that worry about sedimentary rocks had just a wonderful time with this and actually still are. But you can see that there's this flat lying layer. These are, this is the stripy layer and the rocks sort of look like they're waving a little bit. Um, the people that worry about sediments looked at this and said, well, we think we know what this means, how, this, how these rocks form. What we're seeing here are the deposits from rivers that, into a lake. And this is sort of a model of what they expect, expect happened, that there were rivers coming down off of the crater rim, which you can see here and continues on around. Rivers coming down, carrying sand and mud and stuff into the lake. When the rivers get into the lake, the water slows down, the sand drops out to the bottom. And so you get sand along the edge, deltas, forming along the river, sort of like the Mississippi Delta, that same kind of shape. And then in the bottom of the lake, you get mud. And this area here is, in this here where you're getting the river deltas, further along the way towards Mount Sharp, we found some very finely layered, fine grain rocks that used to be mud. So I think, we think that this is what was happening here, that these rocks were formed when the, when the crater was basically filled with water, it was a big crater lake, and we're seeing just the remnants of that right now as the rocks uh, left over. So water, again, another potentially habitable environment. Um, as we went on a little further, we saw this cool outcrop. Is, these are the mudstones, and they're cut by all these white lines. These are veins deposited by water, mostly calcium sulfate minerals. So for those of you that know minerals, are called anhydrite. And <coughs> these represent water, but at a very different time. These formed after the muds that were in the lake solidified and turned into rock, and then were broken. And then the, waters, the water flowed through the cracks in the broken rock and deposited this white, these white minerals in it. So another, another case where we have water. Um, here. Um, okay, moving al along a little further, we're getting, getting closer to the end here. Um, we moved to an area uh, called Marias Pass, Bridger Basin, um, which is down in here. And what we saw there is really interesting for the, uh, for the history of the place. We saw mudstones, the same as I showed you in the last slide, which are down here. These are an ancient lake bottom deposit. And they are, on top of them, is a sandstone called this, we call the Stimson Formation. And from the structures in that, the sediment or sedimentology people are sure that this, this, these were not lake deposits. These were sand dunes from a huge sand sea, like in Arabia or um, the Sahara or South Africa. So what this change is showing is like a complete change of, of environment from being a, a wet lake bottom to being 
a dry sand dunes, from being a lake to being you know, the most deserty place you can think of on Earth. It's not clear how much time is in between those, whether it was just one right after the other or whether there was billions of years in between. We don't have any way of telling that. But it was really neat to see that we had this, that we could see these different, these changes in the geology of the crater. Uh, something I want to point out is that there's some white stripes here. These are veins that we'll get, get to them a little bit later. It's another indication of water. Okay. So I've been talking all this time about pointing out these Bagnold dunes, these black sand dunes. But we finally actually went and visited them. Yay! Um, so as we traveled down here, we went to this site labeled here Gobabeb, which is one of the names. It's a name from Namibia, which was one of the samples we looked at. And this is a close-up of the area. And what, where we went was right along this dune, which we named Namib Dune. And the next slide shows what this looks like. This is from the camera on the mast looking back to the back of the rover. This is our power supply, our radioactive power supply. And there's the sand dune in back. And it's a gorgeous sand dune that's uh, very similar to a dune you might see on Earth. And uh, I've made a comparison here for you. Um, this is, of course, the one, the Namib dune. And this is, I found these great pictures of sand dunes in Namibia. So, you know, how better can you get? Um, they're, they're made of different stuff, of course. These are black. They're made of basalt lava rock sand. And these are reddish. They're quartz sand that has iron oxides in them that give them that rusty red color. So completely different chemistry. But the physics is the same. They're little hard particles that are getting blown around by the wind. And you see very similar features on them. There's ripples on the face of the dune here. There's ripples on the face of the dune down here. Um, you see fairly sharp edges to the top. There are these places where the sand has just flowed down on its own. Same thing here, and where is it? One over here. And the same cute little uh, scars at the top where the sand flow started there, and they're very similar. The physics, you know, physics ought to be the same one planet to the next. And this pretty much shows, well, you expect to see that, and it, it's actually true. Uh, <clears throat> There's one really big difference, though, between them, and that you can see down here in the Namib one. There's this funny green stuff. That we haven't seen any of that on Mars. There's not very much green on Mars so far. But also, I've, I've got a blow up here of this little spot on the sand dune, and perhaps you can see that there's some funny marks running up there and running across. Those are animal tracks. I'm not sure exactly what, maybe, maybe lizards or maybe rats that come out in the night and forage for f food when it's a little bit cooler down in Namibia. We did not see any of that. There's no indication of animals crossing these dunes. We haven't seen animals, but here's where the iguanas come in. Other people have. <laughs> and all of the images that the rover, rover makes are publicly available, I think, the day after they're taken or the day after they come down to Earth. So anybody can go to the web and find every image that was taken on this mission. And a lot of people do this, and they look for interesting stuff in them. And well, I think that honestly does look like an iguana, or some, some kind of lizard, doesn't it? I mean, you can see the eyes, and there's the mouth, and there's a crest on the back. Uh, this one, I don't know if that's a mouse or not, but the guy's drawn in some lines to help us see this. And I give credit, these are all from ufodaily.com. <laughs> and here's one, it might be an iguana, or maybe it's a rat, it's a little hard to tell. And here's just a gorgeous one. That, honest to goodness, looks like a frog. You see the eyes sticking out on the little... Okay, um, this is sort of one of those teachable moment kind of things that, yeah, you can see these pictures, but just think about the surroundings. What does a frog need to live? At least a frog on Earth. <laughs> well, it needs to have some water to live in and to lay its eggs in, and it'd be awful nice if there, if there were a, a dragonfly or something going by for it to eat. Um, the, the issue, of course, here is that these can't really be animals the way we think of them on Earth, because on Earth, we're not just an isolated being. We're part of the huge ecosystem that's all connected together, that the frog doesn't exist on its own. It has 
it, it relies on an innumerable other uh, animals, plants, conditions for it to be alive. And we don't see those on Mars. I mean, there's no water, it's too cold. You know, a frog at, fi at uh, 20 degrees Fahrenheit is not going to be a happy creature. <laughs> um, so, and you know, you, you can turn this around and say, okay, well, maybe these are actually fossil things. Have any of you collect fossils that done any of that? This is one of my joys in, in my early life was fossil collecting. Fossils don't look like that. The only fossils that actually have the same shape as a fossil as they did when they're alive are seashells. Snails, clams, brachiopods, stuff like that. Uh, a fossil lizard, well mostly you're likely to find just bones, right? If you happen to find, and bones just scattered about, if you happen to find the bones stuck together, most often they'll be like those pictures of, of, of dinosaurs where the ligaments pull their head back and they end up looking like this. Uh, almost never find animals that are mummified. And even then they don't look nice full flesh like this one here. So it's possible to see all kinds of this stuff in the images. Uh, we don't believe any of it really. We haven't seen any, any signs of life now or fossil life. It, <clears throat> if we had seen a dinosaur bone, we would have stopped. There's no question. <laughs> we look every time. Okay, so going back to the sand dune. Um, we played around in the sand dune a while, scuffed at it, took some samples. And this is a really nice kind of image. This kind of image is taken by the rover itself, by the camera, this Molly camera on the arm. And it's like a selfie. You know, you take, you, you take a picture of yourself with your, your little camera. You don't see your arm mostly. And that's what's happened here. This is where the arm would be, but the, the images don't include the arm. So even though the arm is there, none of these selfie images include it. But there we are on Mars. There's the mast, cam the mast and the mast cameras and our lovely sand dune. Now, Molly here was just at the peak of performance because it took some gorgeous pictures of this sand. And these, are the, these would be the first pictures that show sand grains, isolated sand grains on Mars. And so this is the sand that's in the dune. Uh, it's taken at night with, the, with LEDs on the, on the Molly camera itself, so there's nice even illumination. You know just what the illumination is like. Sand grains are about a third of a millimeter across. They're you know, fine sand, well, it's the kind you might find on a beach. And what I've done is I've blown up part of it here, as you can see the detail, just fantastic detail there. Now I told you that these sand, this sand is basalt rock sand. And just from this picture, I can tell what most of the minerals are. Because, you know, as a geologist, I know what kind of minerals are in a basalt. But uh, it, it's pretty easy to see. They're light green grains, which I'm having trouble seeing from this angle, maybe like this one and that one. Those are a mineral called olivine, very common in basalts. They're clear crystals, this one and this one here. That's another mineral called feldspar. And the black things, which are probably the most common, are either the mineral called pyroxene or basalt glass, just the, the frozen glass from the lava. And just by counting these, it's pretty similar to the results we get with our Kemen instrument that does this x-ray diffraction and measures how much, many of, how much of the minerals are there. So this is the first time we've really had, anyone's had a really good look at sand on Mars. Okay, so let's move on. Another part of sand, of course, is that sand blows. That's why the sand dunes are there. And that gives, gives us a real good insight into the geologic processes that are happening right now on the surface. Mostly what's happening there right now is the sand is eroding stuff. The wind-blown sand is blowing across the surface and eroding the rocks that are there. Now, I showed you this image before. And look at it a different part now. Why would this rock be undercut like that? Why would it be you know, leaning that way. Well, if you look at the others in the image, and I hope you can see them, I don't know what the resolution is like, many of them are cut in at the bottom on the left side. That one, that one, that one somewhat. This one, if you can see it, uh, has got a really thin little cut at the bottom of it. What's happening here, should be familiar to anyone that's been on the beach when there's been wind blowing. The sand on the beach bounces along 
under the wind hits your foot and stings. The next sand grain comes along, hits your foot and stings again. And if it wasn't your foot, if it was a rock in there, every time the sand grain hits the rock, it might knock a little piece of it off and grind it down. And that's what's happened here is the sand was blowing from left to right across the surface and eroding the bottoms of the rocks. You see that the sand got up maybe that high off the ground, not very high. But it's still pretty good because Mars's atmosphere is only a hundredth as thick as ours is, so it's got to be pretty good wind with such thin air to move the sand like that. Um, sand erosion is also sort of, has another really neat effect we see sometimes. And this is in one of the sandstones. And of course the sandstone is made of layers. They're, you can see the sort of steps down here layer by layer. Some of the layers are stronger than others. For instance, like over here you can see this layer s sticks out, this layer sticks out, and there's a, in between there must have been some other layer of sand that's gone now. It's been eroded out by the sand grains, these sand grains being blown by and hitting it. And so sometimes it makes very strange shapes like this here, the spoon. This is a little tongue of rock that's sitting, that's sticking out. The rock underneath it was weaker and was worn away by the sand. You can see the shadow of the spoon down here. It really is sticking out there, you know, four or five inches, just on its own. Um, it's not unique. Here's another one, maybe even a little longer, more like an iced teaspoon. Um, another one down here, a spatula, and another one here. It's, it's, uh, it's just marvelous to see these. Okay, um, all right, let's get, we're getting toward the end of the talk and toward the end of, toward where the rover is right now. What we've been looking at recently has been those white veins, remember I pointed them out to you on the big outcrop of the, of the sand sea sandstone. And this is a really good picture of how they work. This is the same kind of sandstone and you can see that there's a, a crack, a fracture that runs this way that's been turned white on either side of it. And another crack that runs this way that's been turned white on either side of it. Uh, something's happened to the rock that's changed its color, changed its composition. Pretty sure that this is liquid water again, so we're very interested in what that water was like and whether that might have some implications for habitability. Um, here's another example that's not quite so light colored, but here's the crack running along. And our ChemCam instrument did some analyses running across it. And right at the fracture, it's very rich in silica, like agate or quartz. And as you go away from it, it gets to this darker stuff, which is just this, the, the sandstone that it started. So we've been looking at these in some detail and have drilled several places where we've, we've taken samples from the lighter stuff near the crack and the darker stuff farther away to compare and see what kind of chemical changes have happened. And this is another Molly selfie here, which shows there's a drill hole in the, the sandstone itself, the, the darker. And back here on the other side of the mast, there's some lighter spots and that was a hole that was drilled in the lighter material. We've analyzed those both. Uh, the really cool things about this site, though, is right in here. These are some rocks, just you know, rocks that were sitting there that the rover ran over and broke. The rover's actually pretty heavy. And when there aren't pokey rocks there, it can break the rocks underneath it. So I'm going to zoom in on this. And that little bright spot right there is this. And so that's, these are the broken rocks. The wheels went over it and did bad things. But you can see in this set of rocks the, the difference, the, the, both the light and the dark rock. Here. This is the light rock that's right next to the, this fracture where the water flowed. This is the darker one, both in the same slab, lighter and darker. And this was just a serendipitous thing right here. This little piece had both the light and the dark right together in it. So Molly took some pictures of that. And this is the picture. This is a single rock surface. Here's the dark rock, the sandstone, unaltered. And here's the lighter stuff, the altered sandstone. And just, just a knife-sharp boundary between them. It's just amazing. 
Most of it is filled with one of these cal one of these calcium sulfate mineral veins, but not everywhere. And it's just a knife sharp boundary, even where the where the vein isn't. Okay, so I've taken this and blown it up, and this is you can now start to see the individual pixels in the Molly image. So this is about as good as we're going to get. This little grain here is this one here. So you can see how well we're blown up. Um, this is what the, the unaltered sandstone looks like. And it, it looks like a sandstone. It's got all kinds of fragments, larger pieces, smaller pieces, all kinds of different colors all stuck together in it. Very typical of a sandstone. But just across the way, right here, it's completely different. There's still some black pieces left behind. But the darker stuff is mostly now sort of reddish colored. And what used to be this dark matrix among the larger grains is now all white. So it's just an enormous change in the composition of the rock here. And this is, this is the kind of thing that we're going to be investigating. This is work that is not, not complete yet. But I just wanted to show you sort of where we were on this. Now this is that same, that same rock tipped on its side. And I want to just compare what, the, what was on the, the dark side of the rock, the unaltered rock, with the light side. So I've tried this, this cute table thing here. Our Kemen instrument, we took samples of both of these and analyzed them, and they're really quite different. Um, <clears throat> this feldspar, the clear mineral, is, is similar. Pyroxene, the very black mineral, is way down. Iron oxides are way down. Sulfate's up. And the amorphous material, this is material that has no really good structure to it. In the X-ray diffraction, we don't see any real good structure to it. Um, uh, there's a lot of it that's glass. Probably the original stuff here is glass. Basaltic glass, lava glass. It's just molten lava that cooled so quickly it didn't have a chance to crystallize. On the other side, though, it's a little bit different, and it looks more like opal. It's not precious opal, the kind that has the beautiful colors in it, but it's still at that same stuff. It's a silica mineral that is, doesn't have very good crystal structure. And there's a lot of it there. And that's probably where the white color comes from. And we see the same thing in the chemistry, the chemical composition from this APXS instrument. Uh, iron goes way down from the dark to the light, which makes sense in a way because iron is what makes things dark colored and red colored. And that decrease from there to there goes along with the difference in the amount of pyroxene and the difference in the iron oxides. Magnesium changes down. That's the pyroxene. Sulfur goes up, and that's from the sulfate minerals. So, and the, the, there's, there's also a lot of data from this ChemCam, this laser thing that, that shoots little spots in the rock. And it, it, a lot of data from that, and some of the spots, individual spots here, have gotten up to 80% silica. So this is really like an opal, like you might buy at the store, at the, at the gem store. Um, I got to say, honestly, these numbers are not for this rock. They're for a separate, a separate pair of very similar rocks. We have numbers like this for this pair, but they haven't been processed completely yet, and I'm not at liberty to say what they are. We have rules about this. OK. So in any case, there's been this incredible change in the rock chemistry. Somehow water is involved, and one of the projects we're, gonna, we're working on is trying to see what it takes What's involved in taking a rock that's like this, a dark sandstone, and turning it into something like that? So that's work that's ongoing. OK, getting to the end. We are eventually going to go up the mountain here. And we're down right at the sand dunes right now. Um, and this is where we are. Um, here's our Bagnold sand dunes, dunes again. There's the Namib dune I talked about. We're right there. And the high-rise orbiter just took these pictures Sunday of the area we're sitting in uh, with all these it, well, fractures that are, make straight lines in here. And that spot right there, I've blown it up, that's our orbiter. That's where we were on Sunday. Today we're just a little bit over there. So that, I think that's real cool. <laughs> okay, so where do we go from here? We're now up in this vicinity. This is the base of the mountain. And our plan is to run across this flat plains and hit some of the rocks that I told you about at the very beginning of the talk. There's this 
layer that appears to be rich in hematite, this iron oxide mineral that seems to involve water. Beyond that is in green is this rock unit that seems to be rich in clays, again, that in, has, almost has to involve water. And then we'll transition up into the mountain itself, which has the sulfate, which we don't think necessarily involved water in its formation. So with any luck, we'll be, trans we'll be following along here rocks that record the transition from early wet, warm Mars to a current day cold, dry Mars. This is going to take a while. Um, it's, we're going to be here at the end of the mission probably four years from now. We, you know, we can only travel about 50 meters a day legitimately, so it takes a long time. Uh, and you might ask, why is the mission going to end then? Um, the, the big problem, what's going to end the mission for Curiosity is power. And we have a, unlike the Opportunity rover, which has solar panels, we have a radioactive power generator. The radioactive, the plutonium in it, makes heat, and there's some thermoelectric uh, elements that convert that heat into electricity. So the name of this and lovely NASA acronym is Multi-Mission Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator. Okay, MMRTG. That's where we get our power. Radioactive substances decay over time, so there's less and less of the plutonium to make the power as you go on. Also, just any, any instrument, any device will decay and get worse over time. Particularly here, the thermoelectric parts are declining in power. So what we're seeing, this is a graph of the power output versus time. Just look at the black line, the average. We started out landing with power of about 115 watts that were being generated on average. After the first year, we're down to about 105. We lost about 10% of our power output in the first year. And we'll continue to lose about 10% each year. And this might not seem like a big deal, except that there is a, a, a floor down here somewhere. The rover, uh, all the electronics, the computers and stuff, in, have to be kept warm. They're inside the body of the rover and they have to be kept warm. Warm meaning above freezing or above minus 20 centigrade, I think. <coughs> And so and more and more of our power is going to be spent just keeping the electronics going. And at some point, four to six years from now, we won't have enough power even to do that. And that'll be the official end of the mission. So that's sort of where we're going, where we've been. So we are, we're going to be traveling across this again. Here's this Murray Formation, the mudstones, this hematite unit, the clay unit. And we will be going up this draw here, and the end of mission will be someplace in amongst those three peaks. And so that, I believe, is the end of the talk. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for coming out and braving the weather, and I hope we all get home safely. I hope it hasn't been raining all the time I've been chattering here. Questions. All right, let's take a few questions. What is the total distance uh, traveled? Okay. Uh, the question was the total distance traveled. We have traveled now about, I think it's about 13 kilometers on the wheels. It's more like 8 or 10 as the crow flies because we had to do a lot of, a lot of wiggling around. Uh, as I said, we can't travel very far. We're limited to, to, to about 50 meters a day, you know, maybe 100 on a really good day where we've got a good view. Originally, the plan was to be able to travel a lot farther and faster than that. We had an, auto, an automated system that could pick its way through the terrain, but it wasn't trained to pick its way around pokey sharp rocks. So we just haven't used that automated system not since the first uh, first year of the mission. Yeah. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Okay, so I got a, I think it's a two part question. Uh, the first one is, uh, obviously the, the big question is, do you, we have an idea what changed the global climate of Mars and, uh, this, and when that might have been? Mm -hmm. And then the second part is that fine white line uh, 
you know, kind of reminded me of the global iridium layer on Earth <laughs> a little bit. And I was wondering if that could be the transition point or if you think that's just a coincidence. Okay, well, the, the fine white line in that rock, that was probably a fracture that was later in the rock. And so it really doesn't have anything to do with the overall span of geologic history. But it's a very good question about why, <clears throat> when and why Mars climate is thought to have changed. Uh, when you look at Mars, <clears throat> the oldest surfaces on Mars, the ones that have the most impact craters, are sort of smoothed out. They have river channels on them. And <clears throat> the guess is then that those this was the smoothing in the river channels, of course, were from liquid water at the time. Then there's a pretty sharp transition at about, it's hard to know exactly, but somewhere around 4 billion years, 3.8 billion years, where all of a sudden those river channels basically go away and craters, impact craters, are not smoothed anymore. They're very sharp still. So something happened right in there that changed the amount of water, the channels on the surface, and the way the surface was eroded from being smoothed down to still being sharp. The best guess, I think, at this point <clears throat> is that Mars just got too cold. And at some point in there, Mars got cold enough that all the water in the atmosphere froze out into the poles or into ground ice. And at that point, <clears throat> there wasn't any water anymore to make the channels liquid water or to cause this erosion. And, and that's probably the best idea. Um, another part that goes into it is that the Martian atmosphere has been eroding away over time. Uh, that's something that this MAVEN mission I talked about at the beginning is, is studying. That Mars has almost no magnetic field. It's not like the Earth where our nice magnetic field protects us from the solar wind. Whereas on Mars there's no magnetic field to speak of. And the solar wind, these particles coming out from the sun, hit the Martian atmosphere and strip off atom by atom. And if you go over 4 billion years, it strips off a lot. So it could be that the Mars just got colder from, you know, sun's changing sun, or it could be that the atmosphere was thinned enough by the solar wind that at that point it, it, it couldn't keep the heat in. The other possibility is that that time records when, the, when, the, the, when Mars's magnetic field quit. So before that, there was an ice magnetic field that protected the atmosphere, and then it quit, and the atmosphere started getting, getting blown away. A couple answers. I don't think there's a really definitive answer to that yet. Well, help them. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, my question is about the power. Um, yeah. The 10% a year, am I correct? That's 10% of the original level of power. Yeah. But rather, but, but if yeah, it comes you, 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 you're right. I simplified it a little bit. It's 10 it's percent of the power that's present at the beginning of the year. And that's sort of the typical radioactive decay kind of uh, sequence. Um, the other part, though, I mean, it's not just the radioactive decay. Plutonium has a half-life of 88 years, more or less, plutonium-238. But the other part is that the thermoelectric elements degrade over time. And the whole, you know, the, imagine the whole rover is subjected to a lot of thermal stresses. It goes, as that first slide shows, goes from, you know, in, in the daytime it can be minus, you know, it can be minus 10 centigrade. At night it can be minus 100 centigrade. So there's a lot of thermal expansion that ha you can't adjust for it all. So over time all the pieces are slowly degrading that way. Another part is we've had a couple of shorts soft shorts in the power supply where little whiskers of metal have grown across the, uh, the uh, thermoelectric elements. We can get rid of those by, you know, by, by shocking it, putting a lot of, lot of current through it that burns the short, the short away. But you know, eventually these are all building up and degrading our power. Yes? Yes. Um, I was always taught when I was in college many years ago that um, <laughs> that Mars is mainly red because there is a lot of iron and sulfur in the rocks and yet the samples you just showed there wasn't that much iron in comparison to some of the other ones. Yeah that's absolutely correct. Uh, the the red color on Mars is iron. It's iron oxide. It's this mineral hematite or another one called gertite. They're ferric iron oxides. That's that's where the red color comes from doesn't take a lot of those to make red colors. 
like the dunes in that scene from Namibia are nice bright red, but those are just little, little skims on top of the grains, maybe a couple of micrometers thick on top of the sand grains. It doesn't take a lot of iron to do that. Um, the rocks here are a lot less rich in iron than the ones that the Opportunity rover has seen at Meridiani. And that's more that the Meridiani site with all of its acid sulfate minerals is pretty unusual. This area, Gale Crater, is more typical Mars. So I, mean, I, I didn't show you very much of the chemistry, not knowing exactly how deep to get into that. But for instance, the, uh, the sandstone over here, 22% FeO, is actually a pretty, pretty big lot of iron. So, yeah, I mean, you, you, you are correct, but uh, it doesn't take a lot of iron to make that bright red color. Yes, back. How many wheels do you have to lose before you are <laughs> immobile? Does it matter which <laughs> wheel? And uh, is that more likely or less likely to go first before the power does? Um, certainly we can go with five wheels. The opportunity, I'm sorry, the Spirit Rover limped along on five wheels for quite a long time. And it's, I think it sort of depends which ones. Like if, if both front wheels went, the rover would tip over. If we lost middle wheels, it's not such a bad deal, or if there's one scattered around. Um, as far as what's likely to happen, you know, I don't know whether we're more likely to lose the wheels or lose the power first. We've passed we've now passed over this hummocky surface that had all the pointy rocks and we really haven't seen much of that uh, <clears throat> in the last year and from orbit at least it looks like our path going on isn't going to have that same kind of surface so with any luck the wheels are going to hold and so my guess is it's probably the power but we'll see at any time one of the wheels you know you could hit a hit a rock bad and wipe out a wheel. But they try very hard not to do that. Yeah. Realizing that a lot of your results are preliminary at this point. So far, any big surprises? Any results that have just knocked your socks off? Well, you know, yeah, they, there's some that knocked mine off, but they might well not have any effect on your socks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, from 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 my perspective as a person who studies igneous rocks, volcanic rocks, and stuff like that, we have run into some very, very peculiar igneous rocks there. Um, there's <clears throat> one early on that was named Jake Mateevich, very rich in sodium and potassium, just unusually, bizarrely rich. Uh, the rocks at this Kimberley site that I mentioned are almost unknown on Earth they have so much potassium in them. But that's sort of the kind of thing that a, the, you know, the cognoscenti, the, 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 the person who loves igneous rocks is really going to get excited <laughs> about, which is me, but not you. <laughs> um, as far as, you know, I, I think the, the biggest result for you know, general consumption, if you will, from this was the, the in effect, proof that there were lakes in this crater. This has been suspected, looking at the rocks from orbit, seeing these clay-rich layers from orbit, made people think that that was the case. But we've now got rocks on the ground that absolutely prove, as well as you can prove anything in geology, that there, were, that there was a lake there. Okay. Yeah. Hi. So um, when Curiosity first um, landed, was first sent mm -hmm. to Mars, it was the closest thing we had to actually putting forth the extended sensorium and the mind of man kind on mm -hmm. Mars. It was right. the closest thing we had to almost putting human beings right. on Mars. And so the fact of the matter is, where do we go from here? Because as you're saying, I was just reading that mm -hmm. uh, we were supposed to, meet, supposed to make it to Mount Sharp, Curiosity was, uh, in 14 months. Obviously, there's yeah. been a slowdown. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, that from, wasn't going to happen. From, 20, from 2013, there's yeah. been a slowdown, which is maybe a good thing uh, because it's allowed us to be able to stay up there longer and find new mm -hmm. in adventures <coughs> and so forth. But it is going to come to an end. But and I think that the key thing now is that if we look at what's ha as we look at what is happening 
around the world, particularly what China's doing with the investigation of the far side of the moon, mm -hmm. it really makes the point that we need an extended mission of some sort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about that? Yeah, um, I think the longer, the longer the rover can stay up, certainly <coughs> the more we'll learn. And in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the long run, it's far cheaper for NASA to have a rover last extra years than to send a new one up there. But your question about you know, the human sensorum and all really gets to one of, I think, one of the biggest issues with this rover and human exploration. Um, we've gone, what, what did I say, 10 kilometers, 8 kilometers as the crow flies. You could have walked that in, in most of a day. And we've taken four years to do that. Um, the, uh, the rover is so complex that, in my opinion, it's almost beyond the limits of complexity to plan. And I, of course, I, <clears throat> I didn't talk at all about this as a whole nother talk, but what we do in planning the rover is we'll, we'll do it one day at a time. We send up one set of commands a day. And it basically takes eight hours of 50 people working their butts <coughs> off to make sure that the commands are up and right. And so it's sort of at the limits, I think, of, of what humans can do. And if we had a human up there, you know, none of this would be necessary. So yeah, we, you know, we're sending our senses up there, but there's, it's not all the senses. It's, it's, you know, the eyes and the nose and stuff, but not the brain that integrates it and says, yeah, this rock is interesting and that one's boring, ignore it. It takes us two days to figure out that rock is boring, ignore it. Whereas you could do it, you know, you could do it in five seconds. So, you know, human exploration to me has got to happen at some point. It's much more expensive to send humans up there to support them, to bring the life support and everything. The rover, it, it's a robot. It's a wonderful robot, but it's a machine. But it's... And I, haven't, I hadn't realized it until working on this mission, but the limitations of machine intelligence now are pretty severe, and we are nowhere near being able to do what a human, to have a robot do what a human can do. So I hope that answers the question. Um, lady right over. Okay, get you next. When we came in, we were allowed to pick up this very interesting handout called Mars in 3D. Okay, I haven't One seen One is Olympus Mons. Mm. I guess that's some sort of big mountain. It, it's, yeah, the biggest mountain, the biggest volcano in the solar system. Okay, yes. and what is this Vedra Valles? Well, I haven't seen that. Uh, the name doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> 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 Not to claim that I know everything about Mars. Oh, okay. That's um, yeah, Vidra Vallis. That is a, a valley system. I believe it's probably just north of the Vallis Marineris on Mars. I'm not positive exactly, but that dates. It, it's it's a water it's a water cut channel, and it dates from a time later than anything that we've seen at Mount Sharp. It's a time where Mars was basically very very dry, like it is now. But every now and again, for unknown <coughs> reasons water just came shooting out of the, out of the ground. Um, and if you look at that, there'll be what well, looks like sort of a crater, a hole, and then the channels run away from it. The water shoots out of, apparently shot out of the ground at this crater and ran away in huge floods, mostly to the north and to the northern plains. And I think that's what, you, I think that's what that image is. A lot of theories as to about why there might have been these huge outflows of water no really convincing explanation I know of right now. I think that's what it, it not having read the, read the back or knowing from my previous experience, that's my guess on it. I will take one more over here. Yeah, this is the young lady. Hi, um, I had a question about the evaporite minerals, if you found any besides the anhydrite, and yeah. if there was a pattern of how they were deposited. I'm sorry, there was a pattern? If there was a pattern and how they were precipitated. Oh, yeah. That's actually been a very complicated because the question had to do with the, the salt minerals that we've seen in the, in the rocks there. And <clears throat> she mentioned this calcium sulfate mineral and hydrite, which makes up most of the veins. 
The veins also have a water-bearing calcium sulfate called bassanite in them too. Uh, we have not seen a lot of the other kind of salt minerals like the Opportunity Rover has seen. We, we've had a couple rocks where, where the Kemen instrument has found a few percent of jarosite, which is that iron, potassium iron, very acid mineral that's all over the place where Opportunity is on Meridiani Planum. There the rock is maybe 80 percent this jarosite mineral. We found a couple samples that have only a, a few percent in them. So we have not seen a lot of salt minerals. I don't even think we've seen any halite, the sodium chloride. Uh, and there's been some, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Liz Rampey, who works over at JSC, has, has a paper that she's writing about this. There's one section where he took several rocks, analyzed several rocks in close succession. And for her look at it, it looked as if we, in that area, there was a lake probably a, a very saline lake, and water was draining from that down into the mudstones and depositing and changing as it went down. But I'm probably misrepresenting her work. But basically, we have not seen a lot of, a lot of those salt minerals. What we've mostly seen are minerals that would be typical of basalt igneous rocks, like I said, the olivine, the pyroxene, and the feldspar. So in that sense, it's been a bit of a disappointment because we, on the, on the mineral team, we're all ready to look for these really bizarre minerals and this huge library of all these really peculiar, odd minerals that might have been found. And no, we, we haven't seen them. So. Okay, let's thank okay. tonight's speaker. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> and before I let you go, I failed to mention this earlier. We have a topic for our next series. We don't have oh. speakers and dates, mm -hmm. but it will start up again in fall about September time frame, and all of our presentations are going to be from LPI scientists. Mm -hmm. So we've never done that before. Okay. So you're going to get to learn a little bit more, except Alan, he no, does no, this way too much. No, I, 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 I have one other comment, one other note, which is, besides the fact that there's a tornado, <laughs> um, no, that, that Mars is actually very visible in the sky right now. Uh, there's a handout out in the lobby that shows where it is. It's almost opposition, which means that, the, that Mars is directly opposite the sun from the Earth. And so it's high in the sky, it's bright red, it's very bright, and it's near the star Antares, which is another bright red object in the sky. So if the sky ever clears in the next couple weeks, <laughs>